uh, using a, a, a framework called Pronto. Mm -hmm. I will show some applications of uh, this framework, and then I will conclude with some uh, alternative methods to state estimation that uh, came out recently. First, a few, bo uh, few words about me. I completed my PhD and uh, spent one year as a postdoc at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa, which is not Geneva, um, working on a quadruped robot called HiQ. And then in, th in the summer, I moved to Oxford to join the Dynamic Robot System Group, uh, working with uh, Morris and Yanis and on the platform Animal which is similar in kinematics uh, to IQ, but is electrically actuated. So we start with the introduction on uh, um, proposative state estimation. First of all, state estimation is, is a vague concept, so uh, not to be ambiguous. Um, for, uh, for me, for this presentation, state, state means position and velocity of our robot. If you remember Andrea's um, lesson, these two quantities are not directly accessible uh, from the controller. So uh, if we don't, if we want to leave the fantastic world of simulation, we need someone who provides us a, an accurate enough estimate of these two quantities, otherwise uh, the robot uh, wouldn't behave as expected. In particular, um, for control, we need an estimate that comes at high frequency and should be smooth enough to avoid aggressive uh, control actions. But also for other tasks, like localization mapping and path planning, you can accept uh, a lower frequency, um, but it should be as precise as possible. Um, when we speak about proprioceptive, it means that we are interested in using uh, sensors that measure quantities related to the properties of the robot, like encoders to measure the position of the joints, uh, load cells to measure the torque, um, four star plates on the feet, gyro, IMUs, or uh, micro, um, micro electromechanical IMUs. Um, for exeroceptic state estimation, we use instead sensors that measure the properties of the environment, and we will see this later uh, with Morris. So, the easiest way to perform uh, proposative state estimation is to imagine that our robot is, is a rocket and we just stick an IMU on, a, on the chassis and we integrate all the signals. So orientation would be just um, the previous sample uh, times the exponential of the uh, skew matrix of the um, angular velocity times the delta t and then this can be performed easily with the Rodriguez formula, and then you double integrate the acceleration, and in theory, you are done. However, we know that this can't really apply to legged like robots because there are always intermittent contacts with the ground impacts, and the double integration uh, leads to uh, a drift that can't be uh, withstand in a legged like machine. But we speak about leg like machines, so why not we exploit the fact that we have legs? So the main ingredient of proposative state estimation legged like robots is legodometry, which is a concept similar to uh, wheelodometry. So the idea is to estimate the incremental motion of our robot, um, assuming that there is at least one leg that is fixed on the ground, and therefore you can intuitively uh, think of uh, 
your displacement forward as a displacement backwards of your life. <coughs> of course, the non-slip assumption is required because otherwise there is no way to measure the relative velocity between the end effector and the ground. <coughs> there are many ways to um, categorize uh, state estimators. Um, we can distinguish them in, in, um, on how you measure the contacts, um, how the state is defined, how the IMU and legodometry measurement are fused together, and how many legs you want to fuse together. So the first, the very first example of legodometry was applied to this uh, huge robot. It belongs to a time where uh, researchers thought that uh, space robots would had to be very big. And this is an exopod robot that <coughs> moves one leg per time. So. The intuitive idea is that we should minimize an error that is, in practice, the location of your foot in the work frame uh, minus the position of the foot in the base frame. And the, the quantities to find are the absolute rotation and the translation. This works only if you can detect what is the swing leg and for this they assumed that the swing leg moves uh, has a big displacement with respect to the other legs that are static on the ground and this method also assumes that there are at least three legs on the ground otherwise it's impossible to know your, um, your location and these uh, conditions are very limited for our applications, but for this particular application, uh, we're enough. There are other problems related to this, like the fact that the problem is over constrained, um, but there are details. Marco? Yes. Uh, where was this built? This one is from CMU. When? 1991. Um, I think the guy who developed this was called uh, Krotko or something like that. We, I can look for the name if you are interested. Later on, some smaller platform <coughs> arose, but still the state estimation uh, had some assumptions that are not general. In particular, many exopod robots give you the advantage of uh, having like a certainty that at least three legs are on the ground, which is um, not possible for quadrupeds who, which trot, for instance. And uh, some uh, work with quadrupeds were aided by motion capture, so not the full state was recovered. But with a new generation of uh, legged robots, and now I should update the slides because there are many new uh, coming out, there was a growing need for a general uh, framework uh, that could work even for a flying trot, for instance, or a, a dynamic gait. So the main approach that was taken uh, was to fuse uh, IMU and kinematics in a common filter, uh, which is very fast and normally it's sufficient to estimate the state <coughs> for control. The important part is that there is no assumption on the shape of the terrain or uh, the gate used. Some of these works uh, assume the presence of contact sensors, some other didn't, and gradually exoreceptive uh, fusion uh, came into uh, these are random humanoids, so I uh, hope I'm uh, not too... Um, Talos is not here, but could be. Um, humanoids are very sim similar in concept, uh, so my talk is mostly for quadrupeds, but 
Uh, for humanoids, it's more or less the same, except that you have a flat foot, so you need to estimate uh, also the orientation of the end effect. And normally, uh, the force is measured with uh, contact sensors. For a uh, quadruped with point-like feet, uh, we can uh, neglect some uh, issues because uh, with the point feet, uh, for instance, uh, there, there is no torque there, you have poor forces. And also, um, in the previous talk, uh, it was mentioned uh, that there are more um, uh, problems of uh, flexibility in the ankles. And I know some uh, students here who worked extensively on uh, to solve this problem. So, as I said, the most trendy uh, way of using uh, IMU legodometry is uh, common filter framework, but there are others that I will quickly touch in the end of my presentation. But now we dive into uh, this uh, method that is very solid and used. Before we start, uh, I would like to point out that no matter what method you use, um, if you use only proprioceptive sensing, there is no way, <coughs> there is no way to um, observe position and your roll and pitch can be recovered because there is always a gravity vector that acts unless you work in space. Um, so the only thing we can do with these two <coughs> things is to limit the drift because uh, integrating a small error over time leads to, to drift in position and you know. also biases uh, play an important role in this. So in a inertial kinematic framework, the normally what we do is use the uh, the IMU as it as they were the contact in, uh, the control input. So uh, the IMU is used for the prediction phase. So um, after proper transformation of a frame of reference and subtracting the IMU biases, then the prior for the filter um, is just the, the integration of the IMU. But there is also special care to be taken for the orientation. I wrote before that we use extended common filter, uncentered common filter. These are um, linear approximation of nonlinear um, functions because the orientation lives in a nonlinear manifold. These arise problems because you want to keep the orientation as a state, but you don't want the singularities. I heard also this uh, uh, discussed in the previous lessons. So normally what is done is to <coughs> keep into the state a representation for orientation that has no uh, singularities, typically quaternion <coughs> or rotation matrix. But then this uh, quantity is still three-dimensional. So the trick is to live, live on a tangential space and keep there only the uncertainty. So you you can imagine that your robot has cones of uncertainty around <coughs> it, but then into the state you keep the uh, another representation here. I, um, I kept the rotation matrix, but it could be uh, the quaternion as well. So the, the rotation is handled um, <coughs> separately. But if you see the other states, it's just you know the the previous uh, the, the derivative times the time the time step. So it's uh, fairly approximation, um, integration approximation. I thought about the assumption of non-slippage. This is important because textbook says if you stay in the friction cone, <coughs> in theory, your foot doesn't slip, so it doesn't move. And to respect this uh, constraint, you just have to ensure that the force is inside 
So if you take the lateral component, you divide by the normal component, and you ensure that this value is below the friction, the friction coefficient, static friction coefficient, in theory, you're not slipping. If you have a humanoid, then there is an additional constraint that you don't want to hinge on, on the boundaries of your foot. So you, you have to ensure that the, the normal force is inside, and you don't want to uh, have a, a torque that allows you to uh, rotate on, on the yaw. So you want also that the torsional friction is, is respected. What if you don't have contact sensors? Then you take the usual uh, dynamic equation of motion and then you extract the force from it. You, you, this is, you must have seen this equation uh, many times already. This is just the part, the actuated part. So um, in Andreas' lessons, there, were, you know, there was the unactuated and unactuated part. If you take the unactuated and you uh, solve for F, um, you have an estimate of your uh, contact force um, from the torque. Can anybody say what's the main issue about having an estimated force instead of measured? It doesn't work. Yeah. Well, uh, on Haiku it worked pretty well. But a problem we have uh, seen is that in this way it's very hard to um, distinguish between the inertia of your leg and an actual force that act on the content. So if your leg is, is heavy and moves around, you will see the force coming up, but this is just the inertia of the leg, it's not a true force that and this could cause problems because for simplicity what you do is you just um, put a threshold on the normal component of the force. This is what is normally done. If uh, FC is uh, big enough, you are kind of sure that th there is no slippage. So we spoke about state. Uh, here x uh, means linear position and theta orientation. Um, so in a common filter framework, the state, uh, which I indicate with the italic, is composed by position, linear velocity, orientation. <coughs> there is no angular velocity because you measure it with the IMU, so there is no need to take it. But you have to add the IMU biases because they evolve over time. Normally, you use a, a random walk assumption. And then, the measurement update, one of the two ways of uh, adding a measurement update is to measure the velocity of your base from the velocity of the foot. Intuitively, your forward velocity should be the same as the backward velocity then you also have to account the rotational part. So um, an estimate of your velocity would be the negative of the velocity of your foot in the base frame minus the angular velocity cross the position of your foot in the base frame. An alternative way, more similar to what um, I've shown you with that huge robot, is to um, <coughs> add, add constraint in position. And for this, you need to <coughs> add the foot position in the work frame inside the state. Um, and this has the side effect of uh, giving you a sort of uh, small uh, um, slum system in the sense that, you know, not a slum, but you can keep track. You, you can imagine that all the footsteps are landmarks on the, on the ground. And you see the ellipses of um, a certain thing grow over time. And this way the, the footstep constrain um, the position of, of the base. So um, now I will speak more deeply on Pronto. And so Pronto is an extended common filter framework that has um, interesting uh, features. And uh, one of them is the fact that it keeps an history of measurement. 
So in this way you can integrate measurement even uh, delayed in time as long as the entire steps <coughs> are correct. And it's modular in the sense that it accepts multiple different sources of, uh, of uh, updates and it's multi-platform in the sense that it has been applied uh, to uh, MAVs, uh, humanoids and quadrupeds. This is uh, the scariest slide, so just to give you an <coughs> overview on how Pronto works, um, you get measurement from uh, the proprioception, so uh, encoders, load cells, um, force store sensors. This pass through the stents estimator to detect the stents and with these values and the stands, uh, you can perform legodometry as velocity update in this case. And this can use to have the posterior of the filter, whereas the <coughs> prior comes from the INU. And later on we will see that uh, thanks to the uh, history of dates, you can also add other constraints from uh, the laser or cameras. An important aspect uh, of state estimation is time. <coughs> I think that you maybe not think when you are in simulation. Um, there are many ways to synchronize signals. Here I'm listing a few. Um, ether cut and force, uh, a common clock uh, among the slaves that command, take the measurement from, from the sensors. Some um, Devices have an FPGA that integrates, like the multisense here. Um, and then there are some algorithms to uh, synchronize uh, uh, synchronous si uh, signals that have been developed. And also, if you have multiple computers, you might want to synchronize, you want to synchronize uh, the messages coming from them. And normally, uh, the network time protocol is the is the algorithm to use. When we speak about legodometry, I already mentioned, but let's just reinforce that the three main problems are the following. So the first one, the most important one, is to know where we are in contact. If we, and when I say that, I, s I mean reliable contact. So contact in a control, from the control point of view, you might want to know as soon as you touch the ground. But for state estimation, you want to know when the foot is not moving, which is not exactly the same as just being in contact. There can be a sliding contact, and this is not favorable for state estimation. Um, once we know which are the legs in contact, you have to extract the velocity from each one of them and decide how to fuse them because you have multiple sources and finally um, for each measurement you want to know how big is the uncertainty so the method I developed a few years ago to solve the to address the first problem is to go beyond the uh, practical approaches of uh, setting a threshold for the normal component uh, of the force and instead trying to learn it depending on which gate you are using because depending on the gate you might have different distribution of force among the legs uh, so the assumption is here that the normal force um, um, is threshold but for a call where the leg the weight is distributed more evenly among the three legs on the ground the threshold should be low. For a trot instead, the threshold can be higher. And here you see these little bumps here are due to the leg inertia. So the, there is no actually a force acting on the, on the feet when they are moving. And so I trained a logistic uh, regressor to learn the, the two parameters of the sigmoid applied on the normal component. And you see for the crawl, the, the threshold that can be set, for instance, at 0.5 is between 1500, and instead for a trot is, is more 
towards 100. Again, the contact starts earlier, but you want the moment where the leg is not moving. So you, you can pay the price of uh, uh, using the IMO for a bit longer, but not having a bad velocity in the room. This uh, gives also uh, a clue on how to fuse the legs together, the, how to fuse the measurement from the legs together, because uh, this sigmoid returns a value of between 0 and 1, which can be sort of interpreted as a probability of contact. <coughs> so you can weight the, all the legs in contact uh, using this value. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, on the previous slide, it's written that you didn't use any sensor to measure the ground reaction force, but uh, earlier you say that it was an issue to estimate it without uh, Yes, sensor. so the, the point is, I can set a threshold that is good for crawl and trot, but then when you trot, you hit the threshold because there is higher inertia. But you could actually set the threshold higher for mm -hmm. trot. So the idea is to have like a threshold that changes over time. <coughs> you, you exploit the model to compute the torque uh, measurement and use the model of the leg to estimate the ground reaction forces. So if the model is slightly wrong in terms of inertia, you, this can uh, uh, actually create problem for, for fast motions. You, so you get a false positive in the estimation uh, of the ground reaction force. Okay. So, so you say learning this threshold is enough after you have it, or you still have issues after that? Well, the most obvious limitation of this approach is that um, if you have a new gate, you have to learn that gate. So, learning um, supervised learning has this uh, disadvantage. Um, later on, some works uh, er, um, later works um, tried to use. Um, unsupervised classification on on the forces so to avoid having this learning phase uh, yes it's definitely uh, a problem you, you need to learn for every game but for our test actually uh, we changed the parameter of the trot and more or less the threshold was, was okay in general this is is still is already better than just deciding an arbitrary threshold and use it forever so it was this <coughs> A starting work you know, to overcome this. And also, um, regarding the effect that the inertia has on your yeah. on your forces, this is a problem of the model, no? Because you should be able to estimate this. So, wh why is it difficult to compensate for this? I well, the model, you know, it's not always perfect. It mm -hmm. will take from CAD. You can. Uh, then you add a new sensor, then also the legs are long, so a small mass in the end effector can be exacerbate this problem. If you need more uh, uh, insights, maybe Michele can explain better because this was a. Yeah, so the, the problem of identifying the inertial parameter of a leg, for example. It's not real because there are some directions, some parameters that are unobservable. So you need to excite, uh, create a trajectory to excite uh, the lag in, 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 um, to, to, to show up <coughs> the parameter, you need to excite in different workspace. And uh, in the end, we, we didn't manage, we tried hard, we didn't manage to have uh, a perfectly reliable model. But, I mean, the, the threshold here is not, is not, uh, uh, that big, so mm -hmm. it's, it's quite small. It's around uh, mm -hmm. between uh, 25 and, and, and 60 newtons. And so, ideally, you are perfectly right. If you have a perfect model, you should not have mm -hmm. to do this. You should not have this problem. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, sorry, sorry. Ah. when you train the regressor, how do you give the label whether the, whether a foot is in contact or not? This is a good question. How to get the ground truth for this? <coughs> so, since I said before, there is no interest in learning when you are in contact. There is interest in learning when you are in real, reliable contact. What you want is to minimize the velocity error. So, 
I took some logs and with the ground truth from Vicon, derived the Vicon, no, differentiated the Vicon. And in this I have velocity ground truth, estimated uh, velocity, and then since there are only 16 possibilities, mm -hmm. um, I got <coughs> that uh, leg combination for each sample that minimized the velocity error. Then I had to do some manual filtering uh, because sometimes a leg combination is pr pr produce exactly the same velocity as another one, so there is a sort of instability. But the main concept is that uh, we want the const the contacts that minimize the velocity. Mm -hmm. I saw another raised hand before. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so have you tried instead of looking just? at the current value of the force instead of looking at the history of the previous, I don't know, 10, 20 values because that could be a much richer information to look at Yes, it, I thought about that um, I'm doing something very much simpler here and which I was about to speak but um, I was afraid to introduce too much delay if you use the history but yes um, um, I, I thought about that. I, I think there was a, a student in Georgia Meta School in IIT, uh, Arian something, a Dutch student at the time when I was doing my PhD, and he, he, had, he had looked into a similar problem. I think he had detecting contact, it was for a manipulator, not for a leg robot and he was using uh, machine learning statistical methods looking at the history of the sensor sensor data to predict whether you have a contact or, or not I'm not sure about what I'm saying but that's my memory Well, if you remember the paper and the name, maybe later we can... I can find it probably Third problem, how to estimate the uncertainty um, Again, normally uh, we just, you know, decide <coughs> a covariance and we keep it uh, for the whole run. But analyzing many logs, I realized that, first of all, if you have multiple legs, you could <coughs> just compute mathematically the covariance, uh, so taking the average of the three, uh, let's suppose there are three <coughs> velocity measurements, because we are using a statically stable gate. Um, then I can compute the two moments of the um, of the of this velocity. But I also notice that when the leg is in contact, even if the normal force is, is very high, so in, in theory it's inside the friction cone, the velocity measurements are, are very noisy. And so I, I, I try to correlate <coughs> the previous force uh, and the current one so the, dif the difference between these two <coughs> which is kind of uh, give a clue on an impact occurring uh, uh, this continuity in force uh, is an indication that you are about to strike the ground so I added this component inside uh, the covariance so in this way, the covariance, so the, the final covariance, let's say, added as a measurement is a combination of a fixed value, the intra-interleg covariance, and the impact, the contribution from the impact. And in this way, you can vary the covariance over time. So this is an example, this is a trot, this is the full velocity, and the blue, dark blue indicates no low covariance, we are about here, and the tracking is good. <coughs> here instead, there is contact, but the velocity is very noisy, so I just increase the covariance because there is uh, an impact uh, occurring. In this way, you can discard these uh, spurious measurements from the filter. Of course, there are, you, could, the, you could help also with some uh, heuristics, you can discard outlier and, and stuff, but 
um, I thought since the common filter uh, accept measurement with the covariance, why not change in the covariance over time too? And this led to a pretty good uh, improvement upon just using a fixed threshold both for uh, force and a fixed threshold for uh, covariance, especially in the four velocity. This is the same trot as before. This is what is fed to the filter and this is what the filter uh, outputs. And this is the ground truth. So th this gets integrated but gets discarded because, because the covariance is so big that the filter trusts more the in this uh, in this uh, small period of time. Um, as I said, there is no way to eliminate the drift without cameras or lasers, but the improvement on uh, reduction of this drift uh, was significant. Uh, this is a trot back and forth, and this is the forward position, and I could reduce it uh, quite a lot. Here are some applications. So. Good state estimation allows you to do cool things. Um, this is a paper uh, published recently on a journal. Um, in this case, the robot is uh, walking statically in a statically stable manner. Without you, here, you see it's rotating, but in this particular moment, it is using only proprioceptive state estimation, and it's able to overcome uh, uneven and also rough uh, terrains. And Michele likes this video. <laughs> it's ma mainly his work, uh, but uh, I contributed with the state estimation part. And this is another work uh, recently uh, accepted for RAL, uh, which combines trotting and convolutional neural networks. In this case, um, there is also some contribution from the vision because uh, we need a very good accuracy here to be able to step uh, onto these uh, small gaps. And the idea here is to adjust the trotting parameters online uh, by applying some machine learning on, um, on the elevation map. So uh, with the, the robot creates an elevation map while it goes and adjusts the, uh, the stride and the step high and length uh, online uh, using the neural network. In this way, it can overcome easily um, uh, these gaps. How much time do we have? Oh, almost, almost finished. Um, Two slides to just give you a glimpse on uh, alternative methods. Um, so this is a work from uh, Peace At Atkinson Group, and is an attempt to you exploit more the dynamic uh, equation of motion for state estimation. Here the state is different. So here in the state they included this is the generalized velocity. So it contains both angular velocity for the joints and linear velocity of the base and is uh, in practice using the now well-known equation, uh, dynamic equation of motion and tries to minimize this error and the error on, on the rest of the state. Uh, so the, the, um, the idea is to solve a QP uh, this one, so as a quadratic um, cost function, where in each turn the matrix A uh, acts as sort of selector on the uh, portion of the state, and B is the measurement. Um, we can discuss later more if you are interested. I didn't see this much applied uh, in practice, but <coughs> it's an interesting work. And then Later on, um, this is a work that uh, recently came out and is used on the animal. Um, it's called two-state implicit filter, and the idea is that <coughs> common filter assumes there is always a process model. There is always a relationship between your previous state and your current state, but sometimes you just don't have this. 
So the idea is instead to optimize um, a cost function that relates your current measurement with your previous state and your current state. So here in the B, uh, there is the measurement, current measurement, and these are selectors uh, for the state uh, of the current and the part. And so this is like the function to optimize, you want to know your state now, and you correlate this with the measurement and your past. If you have the model, you can pretend that your measurement is just uh, the model itself. So you can create um, fake uh, measurements that in reality are your uh, are this arrow here. Uh, with this, I finished this pr first part. Um, if you have questions, I'm available. You can also write me. I would suggest we do a small break. Unless you want to go on. We can take a small break. Yeah. At the very least, I need to plug this in. So yeah. we'll take maybe three or four minutes if people want to. So I can take questions if you know, while uh, we change laptops. So why do you, um, what do you think about the segmentation? Um, so generally speaking, people usually use kind of this thing. Yeah. And why do you think uh, there's a few work on um, whether programming and well, um, common filter has limitations because, for instance, every measurement is assumed to be Gaussian. And if the distribution of your measurement is not Gaussian, uh, you can't integrate, for instance. This is the first thing that comes into my mind. The other is, uh, as I just said, if you don't have a, a process model, uh, you, you can't pretend you have one, you just don't have it. So, about the dynamics um, is an interesting concept because unless the robot is performing a flying trot, in that case it would have a ballistic trajectory. In all other cases, you can't treat it as a missile because what you do is you you pretend that it's a missile because you integrate the IMU like it was and then you try to correct your prediction with leg, uh, leg constraints but instead the IMU and the leg come together so there is a tendency to try to optimize everything together so that work I think that work from um, Atkinson group was more focused on estimating <coughs> well the states of the robot like the joint uh, velocity the, tor the torques um, so I, um, reading the paper you don't have the feeling that this improved a lot the velocity estimation of the base for instance but there was an attempt to unify this um, you know sometimes you try more uh, elaborate things and uh, sometimes a common filter just works it depends on the specific issues that you have so so some people um, in, in SNAM and mobile robots for example even use both like the front end and the front filters that's, that's certainly possible yeah we use like uh, a base optimization we, um, yeah, we talked a little bit about yeah, a little bit about the boundary between those. Um, I think one of the challenges is uh, being able to create estimators at a very low latency. So um, uh, there's not much point in incorporating things like vision into an estimator that's going to a controller if it takes 100 milliseconds for you to com to, to compute visual odometry. Uh, so uh, all of the estimators of all of the robots that we're using don't use vision, so the complicated uh, um, post-graph optimization typically is the optimal trajectory given a history of measurements, but if you're going to incorporate that history of measurements then the robot's already fallen over before you've been able to to, to do that. Um, so we, we live in a space, um, estimation on, on walking robots kind of lives in a space where the control people don't really want a perfect answer, they want a good answer quickly. We, you know, low, low phase offset so that the controller not doesn't become unstable. Um, 
Okay, so um, how are we doing? Uh, feeling good. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, more extraceptive parts of of, uh, of walking robot systems. Um, again, Marco mentioned uh, together with Yanis Savutis, we lead the Dynamic Robot Systems Group, which is a, a pretty new uh, leg of robotics group in Oxford. We've been going for about a year and a half now, um, and, and our our research is kind of focused on. Uh, Animal as a test platform, and this is a field trial uh, somewhat similar to what Marco was, was, was talking about. Human uh, remotely operating or teleoperating a robot to localize and navigate within a prior map, and then we're doing a variety of, of locomotion tasks, uh, some of which are starting to build on our own controllers, but um, in, in many cases here uh, developed uh, building upon work from antibiotics. Um, but we have a variety of perception tasks, so I, I you saw there localization against a prior map using a lighter on the robot, uh, footstep planning and, and uh, for staircase climbing, and just general uh, navigation and obstacle detection. Um, and I'm, this this particular talk, I wanted to be more tutorial and try and give people uh, an idea about which sensors are likely to be useful for your walking robots, rather than to um, to be uh, very technically detailed. So. I um, uh, generally, when I talk to people who are on the control side of robotics, they may be seeing a visual slam system um, using the latest post graph optimization, and then they're interested in using that to better estimate the robot or just to know where the robot is. And um, the, there's some kind of well defined concepts that exist in robotics in, on the navigation side about frames of reference and uh, which information should, should pass to which sensors. Um, and there's, a, there's a very clear distinction between odometry, which Marco talked uh, almost, uh, almost entirely about, and other tasks like localization, and localization also being tending into, into, into mapping itself. Um, and I wanted to sort of maybe, maybe point out uh, the distinction between them. So typically, as Marco mentioned, his talk was entirely focused on internal sensing. So. Uh, either force sensors on the robot's feet or uh, in, in the joint sensor in the joints. Uh, I'm using kinematics and incorporating those, where the, the the preference is on an estimator that has low latency, um, is not over filtered so that we're not introducing any phase offset in inner velocity estimation. Um, and typically in the past, it's 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 always excluded vision. Marco um, Hooter yesterday mentioned maybe there's a, a role for vision to be incorporated within this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our initial work on doing this and um, whether it necessarily finds its way into the control loop or not is another thing. Um, I'll, talk, I'll, talk about, I'll talk about uh, localization, typically done relative to a prior map or um, maybe building a map from scratch um, and talk about uh, methods for terrain reconstruction. So these are kind of the, the three main tasks that we for example, we're using in, in, in that particular field, field trial. Um, <coughs> I'll start with uh, laser localization. So there's a, a variety of different laser sensors that are on the market, and uh, uh, in green I've indicated what are the pros of, of uh, the actuated spinning uh, spinning lasers. So this is a spinning Akuyu, another is spinning Akuyu on the animal, um, or the uh, kind of uh, well-known Velodyne lighters, which are um, <coughs> Uh, which are used, for example, on, on our animal platform, and you'll notice that there's 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 both red and green on both blocks. So, one thing about lidar is that uh, it's it's not there's, there is no lidar that's been developed that is suitable for walking walking robots. Typically, we're interested in in two different tasks: one of uh, of accurately localizing the robot uh, within the prior map, and the second task of of carrying out terrain reconstruction. Um, with it, with the spinning laser. Um, these, these devices have, have external moving parts, so when you're doing practical experiments, like, like many of the ones that Marco was showing, uh, it was an opportunity for the robot to fall, you either have to put it behind a cage like this, um, and the, the, the devices themselves weigh a lot, so uh, antibiotics in particular want to move away from the spinning laser because uh, the inertia of, of a rotating device far away from the center of mass is a, is a significant problem. And then these lasers also are pretty low frequency, so you're getting a terrain reconstruction once every couple of seconds, um, so as you go up and down staircases, you don't observe the terrain quickly enough. It does give you very accurate reconstruction. So this is the most accurate, accurate 
uh, terrain reconstruction sensor. On the, on the Velodyne side, uh, the Velodynes are, are developed for automotive applications, so um, uh, they're developed with, with the assumption that um, the things that, that are being detected, the obstacles of cars, are at least two to three meters away from the, road, from, from the self driving vehicle. So the, the, be, the beam widths of all of these uh, lighters is approximately about a 30 degree, uh, a 30 degree beam pointed down slightly. So they, they're not able to, uh, when, when, when mounted horizontal, they're not able to, to, to sense, sense the ground. Um, their ranging accuracy is a lot less, uh, but they do weigh a lot less. They don't have, I say no moving parts, there's no external moving parts on the, uh, the, the Velodyne 16 and the newer models of the, um, of the Velodyne that I've shown here. Um, so it, this Velodyne, uh, this sensor is not really useful for terrain reconstruction, um, but it is a high frequency. This sensor is, is really good at terrain reconstruction, but it's low, so there's, there are trade-offs in choosing the sensor. Um, in, in, in the past, I would say that for humanoids, because they move typically much slower than, than quadrupeds, the, the spinning laser on here has been, has been used, and it was used on, um, it's used on a number of HRP2s in Japan now. Um, uh, the Kaist robot now has one installed, and all of the Atlases um, had a, an actuated lighter, either of their own design or this, uh, this model from Carnegie Robotics. Um, and just to... Mark? Yeah. What about the prices? What about the prices? Uh, they're expensive. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I mean they're ex they're, are they expensive relative to the cost of the robot? Um, this this sensor is about uh, twenty five thousand, but for that you're paying a hu you're paying a significant amount for the, uh, the the out of the box engineering from the, the spinning laser. The, I think one of the re one of the reasons that Antibiotics in particular wanted to move away from their own version of this is that uh, to get precise calibration of the lidar that when you uh, actuate it that the points are, are very accurate in, in measurements when accumulated into a three D point cloud then the spindle axis has to be well calibrated and that's very tricky to, to be able to get that to continuously move. Um, Velodyne set, the, the, the low end Velodyne puck is, is a more um, COTS device, so you just, it's just a commercial off the shelf product. Um, so that's in the order of uh, 10 to 15 I think offhand. Uh, obviously these are much dra dramatically more expensive. So um, uh, they're not they're not particularly cheap solutions, but compared to the cost of the rest of a, of a working robot, they do fit in quite reasonably. I mean, if you're talking about Talos, it would be a reasonable proportion of the cost of a, of a humanoid. Um, uh, but but then I would say you know there's no perfect sensor. That's the problem. In terms of lidar, we'd like a um, the frontal hemisphere of the robot at high frequency with very low with very accurate sensing, and, and there is no no sensor that's able to achieve all of those capabilities. Uh, they're, they're, just to be clear, they're both lidar, but different implementation of the same. It's, it, yeah, and it, and it kind of comes down to the field of view. So um, with the with the with the Velodyne, you get this field field of view. So this is a the Velodyne here at the top of the animal. You get this uh, this ring, uh, but the ro the robot doesn't see the ground at all here. So there's it, this is all of the data that's that, there's no filtering here. There's no data underneath the robot's feet. Velodyne is sixteen lidar. So when it when it when it's called the uh, Velodyne VLP16 is the model, it's because there are 16 rings here, um, and they have a spacing of about about two degrees. So they they're, they're seeing a, a sweep of the environment. They don't see the ceiling. They don't see the floor. So the the Velodyne is useful for localization in, in an environment, but it's not useful for um, building a reconstruction of a tabletop environment if you're if you be humanoid or it's not useful for reconstructing the ground if you want to build a, a terrain reconstruction for footstep planning um, but the other one can can be used for that but it's slower um, so it's, a, it's kind of a, a choice about what you're using it for I would say the, the, these have been used for humanoids successfully and it tends to be these for uh, we're, we're tending towards using these ones the, the, the better just because we're using depth cameras for, for, for re, uh, reconstructing the ground these days. Um, okay, so moving on a little bit. Uh, I mean, this is an illustration of the, the drift of a typical <coughs> estimator. So uh, Marco talked about uh, inferring, in, in, uh, inferring which feet are in contact with the ground and then using that information to, uh, to uh, uh, c compute velocity measurements for the robot's joints, incorporating that with the IMU information. 
but it's it's un unavoidable to uh, incorporate or to use only internal sensing to estimate a, a drift-free uh, motion of the robot. So as the robot carries out this particular experiment, it's just repeatedly going up and down on the line. Um, what you see here in orange is a point cloud taken at, the, or in green is a point cloud taken at the start, and red is the point cloud of the robot at that live moment. So uh, the white line indicates the drift. So the robot is in this particular uh, trotting uh, controller from from, uh, from the groups in Zurich. It's it's just continuously drifting upwards, and because of biases in the in the orientation, it's uh, uh, its orientation <coughs> is drifting in, in one particular axis. Now you could tune the contact classification so it maybe it wouldn't drift upwards, but then you might change the velocity of the trotting controller and it might drift in a different axis. But unavoidably, there's, there's drift. It's, it's nice that it's characteristic in this particular example. It's just, going, it's just drifting upwards. Um, but effectively, you have, if you have something that you want to manipulate or you want to interact with in the world, then uh, with, it, with particularly more dynamic gates, then your, your state estimator is going to be continuously drifting. Um, but, but this is, this is a useful piece of information when you want to start using the laser sensors. So uh, you have a low drift uh, motion estimate, and we're, what we're interested in is precise localization to a, 3D, to a 3D model. So for example, in the case of our work in the Dark Robotics Challenge, you might have the robot entering this room here, and you want it to autonomously, autonomously be able to navigate across the room. Uh, but like I said, you have limitations in the field of view of the sensor, um, and you might have a lot of clutter in the environment. So Typically, the approaches for laser localization are now doing iterative close of, closest point. Um, it's a pretty well-known algorithm. It's been around for a long period of time. Um, having accumulated an accurate point cloud, you want to register, uh, for example, the white point cloud to the blue point cloud. We, 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 uh, we have an initial guess at the offset between the, the two point clouds because we have this odometry system. So uh, we're taking a point cloud sweep from uh, the Velodyne laser or from, from the spinning Kuyu, and we want to bring them into, into, uh, into alignment. So that's an, an iterative process called iterative closest point. Typically, uh, uh, we use these days a, a, an implementation called a lib point matcher. And, and effectively, it's an iterative, proce an iterative uh, process of alignment in which um, associations are made between points in the map in blue and your latest measurements in white, and you uh, iteratively optimize and, 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 uh, and uh, bring, the, bring the two point lines into alignment with one another. Uh, what's going on under the hood is that for every one of the points in the uh, latest point cloud, you are trying to determine the correct association to a point that's in the map. So what this video here illustrates is uh, for that white, white point cloud that was moving in this video, uh, there is a line that's going to the nearest point in the previous map. And what you see is that these red lines correspond to the inlier sets. So we, 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 look in the, we look for the nearest neighbor in the point cloud uh, from the map. And then that creates a, a gradient when we're optimizing. Um, but we're only interested in taking the set of points that fall within a threshold. So we're looking for points that are near to points that we've observed just now. Um, and then we're, we're, we're creating a gradient for, for our optimization function. And that allows us to iteratively move the, um, the, um, the estimate closer to the, the true estimate. One thing that you'll notice is that the set of points, the blue points are effectively points that are being ignored at a particular time because no successful match or a match outside a threshold has been found. And effectively, the, the operation of these algorithms in realistic, uh, realistic locations is choosing the set of um, set of inlier points such that uh, you ignore uh, places in a scene that you haven't seen before, or you ignore clutter, or you ignore uh, people that you uh, that, for example, might be moving around in the scene. Um, so to do that, uh, for example, uh, the algorithm, uh, these iterative closest point algorithms, like to focus on built structures. So where there is um, uh, where there are points that uh, that form form um, consistent normals, and they're assumed to come from planar structure. Um, and we remove those that don't uh, fall on, on planar structures. So for example, in this view from the Dark Robotics Challenge, there were a lot of people walking around with the robot. Uh, they would, just using the raw LiDAR data, would create, they're moving around from frame to frame, so that would be uh, result in your algorithm breaking. But if you uh, can determine that, they, that they're not forming planar structure, 
and you can filter those out. Uh, and for example, this is a map that would have been created just using the planar structure. This iterative for this point of the reason, as you described it, it seems to be working uh, on each point independently, but actually what you're looking for is a, is a single rigid body transformation yeah. that maps all the points of the, the current map to possibly all the points of the, of the previous map, so it seems like be formulated as a single it is, sorry, it is a single optimization. So for every single, so the, uh, I don't know if blue and yellow can be easily seen here, but for every uh, point in the, the white map, we, we, we find the nearest neighbor of, of blue points and we compute a, a, a gradient so that, uh, and then we, we combine that gradient across all of the points in, in the map and that allows, allows us to move the entire map uh, we recompute the set of the set of nearest neighbors, and then we compute that as an iterative process. So, but you, you basically implement a custom algorithm to solve an optimization problem, and I was wondering what's the advantage of using the custom algorithm rather than formulating it as a gener generic NLP and giving it to IPOPT to solve exploiting the sparsity of the problem. Um, uh, this, I mean, this is. A, I, I'm not, I, I'm not so sure how to, 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 to draw a comparison between, okay. between using it. I mean, this is a, an area, this is a really standard approach for aligning, aligning point clouds that's been going, that's been heavily used for 30 years, so it's, it's, it's not, not really research. Yeah, um, in, in case I did, it was standard to use to do inverses and people are right, yeah. people are right, among others, and so okay. if you do QP, it's a QP. Okay. I was wondering whether maybe here it's the same. I mean, it's a least squares. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the how to, how to relate relate the problems to a, to a QP. Okay. So uh, how how robust you are against local minima? Sometimes the ICP just stalls in a in a situation. Yeah. So like you can you can see it actually happening <coughs> here in the algorithm. It's yeah. Uh, Let's, let's wait for it to start again. So this is a yeah, it's running, running, and then it the, continues. Yeah. So it's, it, the algorithm starts here. It's slowly moving the point cloud to the right. All of these points are not are deemed to be outliers, and then all of a sudden there's this burst mm. of that's that's the problem with this algorithm. It's it's a local algorithm, <coughs> so you need a very good initialization, otherwise the algorithm will fail. Um, in practice, this means that when we're running localization in, in the field environments, the robot has to be positioned stationary and then in, in the interface the human has to indicate exactly where the robot is to start yeah and then yeah. thereafter it's iterating on it's using the odometry the incremental odometry to update it but uh, 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 to to do this uh, detection of what are the inliers and the outliers it's useful to take advantage of like the physical or physical or analysis of the overlap between the point clouds so for example you might have um, in green is, is the previous point cloud, in red is the, is, the, is the subsequent point cloud. If you can do an analysis of what's the physically overlapping space, then you can improve, you can, uh, you can create some heuristics about um, are these points likely to find inliers within, within the algorithm and uh, using heuristics about whether the, 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 these points that, that fall within um, the overlapping space are likely to find inliers, then you can uh, choose the set of points that you want to retain as the inlier set. Uh, one piece of work that we did was to uh, improve the basin of, a, of attraction of, of, of the algorithm. So by um, automatically tuning the set of inliers, we could uh, uh, increase the basin of contractions. This is an illustration of uh, if you took a point cloud and offset it by some, um, some offset, would, would it be able to recover the, uh, the alignment? And with the generic approach, uh, if you move, for example, more than uh, 20 or 30 centimeters away from the initial offset, uh, then the algorithm wouldn't be able to re-estimate the, the, the poles. But by um, more um, carefully choosing the set of inlier points, um, and for example, cho uh, or throwing out points that couldn't possibly have an inlier, then you can uh, increase the basin of attraction of the local problem. So that, that's exactly right, Gerald. Um, and this is kind of a uh, end result of that kind of work is. Um, what we wanted to do for the DARPA Robotics Challenge case is if you wanted to have objects that were in the environment that you're interested in, a valve or staircases or uh, some tool that you're supposed to use, you want to be able to position them once and fix them within your map uh, without using a prior map. So when the robot enters the room, um, to localize them, 
across the entire room. So you don't want to be uh, incrementally updating your reference all the time. You want to be using uh, 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 a reference point cloud that stays consistent. So this, uh, by improving the base of, 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 of attraction of the ICP algorithm, uh, the baseline algorithm could be improved so that uh, essentially using this one point cloud at the very start of the experiment to continuously localize against that so that you can do things like tell the robot to go back to the very starting position. Um, for, for industrial kind of surveys like the, the one that I showed previously, uh, you, might, uh, and, uh, you might have access to quite a lot of knowledge about the test environment. You're building a mission that you want to execute there. So you might uh, have a prior map or you might do a mapping run like Marco was talking about yesterday. Uh, for, the, for the trials that we've done so far, we use a, a survey grid LiDAR. You can see a series of rings on the ground where the LiDAR was moved and we've built up this very accurate 3D, 3D model. And, there, and now instead of iteratively extending or building a map, we, we want to localize within this prior map. And this is now moving towards uh, uh, using the Velodyne. So it's the same localization algorithm. Um, these rings uh, illustrate the Velodyne. So these, um, when we were talking about the 16 ring Velodyne, these are some of the 16 rings of the Velodyne uh, casting onto the ground. So this is the top-down view of the uh, animal localizing within that facility uh, in gray is the, is the prior map and we're just doing pure localization. And this, is, this is suitable for within that environment with great robustness to be able to localize the robot to within a couple of centimeters. Um, but, uh, so, so that gives you localization performance but uh, within, within the Ross navigation system uh, there are s sort of uh, protocols or standards for uh, what information you should you should fuse back to your controller and what you should uh, keep keep separate from your computer. So, uh, from your controller. So, in the first video, I showed the robot um, continuously drifting upwards. So these are the same the, the two same experiments. In the left hand case, the robot is uh, um, its position is being estimated using only its uh, internal sensing. Uh, it's estimating the transform between its uh, between a fixed frame known, known as ODOM or short for odometry and base, and this is smooth with continuous drift. So this is what Marco's estimating. But by using the laser, um, we can um, correct for that drift. But uh, this particular these particular corrections from the laser are occurring at maybe one once per second. They contain discontinuities, so there can be a discrete move uh, uh, tr teleportation of the robot, if you will. Um, that can take uh, uh, that can move the robot maybe by a, cent a centimeter or two centimeters. So that this this particular estimate estimate while not drifting, you can see that the bundle of white lines for the robot is on top of one another. Um, it's not exposed to the robot. So this is estimating what we call the map frame. Um, this is the kind of estimate that you would pass to uh, a task planner or a mission planner, but you wouldn't expose to your controller system. So this. Uh, this is, is pretty well developed, for example, for a PR2 robot, and um, we, we're using this now for, for, for all of our robots. Um, I won't talk too much about SLAM, but the SLAM system would, again, be estimating something that would be in the map frame. This is just the animal walking around a building using this um, iterative uh, ICP algorithm to build a, a reconstruction of, a, of, of its environment. And the next thing is to start doing um, post-graph optimization that, that, that somebody asked about earlier on. Uh, won't talk about SLAM, it's not really uh, a necessary topic for, 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 for our walking robots at this stage. Um, moving on from, from laser, we wanted to look at using vision because uh, with a vision se sensor, while well, you don't have the, the same expense and calibration of, 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 of lasers, um, and also you have the capacity to estimate at higher frequencies. Uh, and you know, a very brief overview of, of stereo vision, uh, assuming that most of you are from control background, uh, using specially calibrated cameras, a left and right pair of cameras, you can estimate a series of point, points in the environment. Uh, you extract corner features uh, from images, and then you match them as they appear on the left and, the left and right image. And that gives you a series of points in 3D space from, for example, time, time one. Uh, this is a visualization of them projected onto a single image. Typically, we're, they're there are corner feature corner points with a descriptor that, that explains the uh, the pattern of pixels around the, the corner, um, and and effectively stereo works by taking a subsequent pair of stereo images 
matching those points and then using um, uh, uh, using Ranzac to estimate the translation between uh, between pairs of stereo images. So you can think of it as um, a very much an industrial way of estimating the relative motion from frame to frame um, using a pair a pair of cam a, a pair of cameras. Um, and this this is this is used in a lot of uh, self-driving car work and a, a lot of uh, wheel vehicle systems. But when you move to uh, something like a quadruped, uh, we're, we're t we want to take advantage of, of what Marco had been developed, which is a low drifting state estimator. But we want to incorporate vision so as to re reduce the rate of drift. We're also looking at incorporate. We've also incorporated the lidar. But the challenges with um, a uh, a walking robot are that camera imagery during, for example, dynamic gates, such as trotting, um, is, is, it's, it's really difficult to work with because uh, the, the aggressive rates, rates of ro uh, rotation cause um, image blur. So here's an illustration of um, a trotting sequence of the animal. Um, and you, just, you, you continuously have the camera moving with, with aggressive jerky motions, such that uh, tracking and retaining those features from frame to frame is a, is a significant challenge. <laughs> So um, uh, to be able to, uh, for example, retain observation and visual features for a long period of time is a major challenge. Um, in addition, uh, the practicalities of incorporating measurements from lasers and vision is also uh, complicated because with a camera image, um, the amount of time to, for example, uh, acquire the image can be in the order of maybe 100 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. Uh, your visual odometry pipeline might be in the order of uh, 30 or 40 uh, uh, milliseconds, depending on um, depending on the camera uh, resolution that you're working with. Um, so that that results in significant latency compared to, for example, the state estimator, which <coughs> might have a budget of a few milliseconds. You want to you want to feed your state estimator that's got very low latency back to the controller, but you want to incorporate the vision system so as to be consistent, um, and that that creates effectively correct corrections in your state estimate that are discontinuous. So, uh, for example, maybe uh, you, would, you would have accumulated laser correction from the laser localization that I've talked about previously. Uh, and this illustrates time in the, upper, the upward axis. At a certain time A, you might have uh, received a laser correction in the history. And that would result in a correction in, in your state. Um, but that results in a correction of the state from a time in the past. So if you were to incorporate that using, a, for example, a history of your state estimator, that would result in the estimate that the robot is, is using at that particular time uh, experience a discontinuity. So you would um, instantaneously correct the, the, the position of the state uh, such that the controller, um, um, it appears to the controller that you've um, hallucinated a, a correction. Um, this is another example using um, uh, maybe a subsequent correction from visual geometry, and, and as time evolves, this is what the estimator would look like. It would look like a smooth motion of the, of, of the uh, kinematic inertial estimation followed by a discrete correction due to your old LIDAR, correction, LIDAR measurement followed sometime later by another old correction from your vision system. So um, it's important to be able to account for this and, and to uh, the estimate that's, that's being passed to your controller doesn't necessarily see these kind of corrections. But if you can start to incorporate these measurements, then you can, with a, a, a system that is purely no prior information, uh, by incorporating first your dead reckoning, which gives you uh, an estimate that's kind of continuously drifting but, uh, with, with a slow drift, incorporating vision, uh, so this is VO for, for visual odometry, you can reduce the rate of drift, and then by localizing against Iterative, iterative point clouds, you can incorporate, um, you can reduce that drift down to effectively, effectively no drift. One of the things that incorporating vision allows you to do is to reduce the local drift rate so that, for example, these discrete corrections from laser might be less significant. Can you use also vision for good um, not, not at this stage for this work. I mean, t typically we've been uh, focusing on using vision as an odometry system and using the laser effectively as a, low, as a loop closure system. It's, um, I think if you go to a, uh, to a SLAM conference, you'll see people are, are, are always talking about visual SLAM. Um, and typically, uh, uh, when we're interested in using this in, in kind of a mission environment, 
we don't really have control of the lighting conditions. We can't, uh, we can't manufacture loop closures typically. We typically just want the robot to operate continuously without, for example, or, we, or can you please tell the robot to look to the left so the, so the visual system can see uh, where it was previously to, uh, to close loops? Because uh, the visual loop closure algorithms um, have, a, have a very low uh, um, reliability when being presented with images from very different viewpoints. So you might have a, a series of visual images from one place in orientation. If you have a camera that's maybe this physical scale of, of maybe a, a meter away with a 20 or 30 centimeter offset, it's unable to close loops. So um, uh, vision is really uh, a, a difficult system to incorporate within a kind of mission scenario. Uh, while LiDAR has a very very wide basin of attraction, so with, with uh, a, a, map, a, po a point cloud map of, um, of this environment from, a, from something like a, a laser, uh, you can move the laser anywhere in this room and it would still be able to localize, but with a vision system, with a visual map of this environment, uh, you'd have to very extensively map the environment from every viewpoint in many different places. Uh, so for practical applications uh, where you don't want to you don't, want to, you don't want to control where the robot is exploring. So, for example, you're happy for the robot to explore in any part of this environment, then vision is, is, is difficult to work on. Now, where you're interested in doing survey applications, you might want the robot to exactly follow where it has been previously. So it makes very repeated sensing, then it becomes more useful. So people do, do things called uh, visual teach and repeat, but that typically tries to uh, enforce the navigation such that the, the robot continuously follows exactly the same route as previously. <coughs> so we do have a site project working on, on, on that space. That also leaders, for example, can get tricky when it comes to coordinates or something like this. Yeah, and yes, and, and we're, we're, we're presented with visual images that are very similar to maybe <coughs> multiple corridors that are visually almost identical, then um, there's, there, there's no visual saliency or visual independence between these, these environments. Um, I mean, it's an active area of research, but uh, LiDAR is kind of just a system that if used in, in the appropriate manner just works. So that's why we tend to use it for localization. Um, uh, so I think about five or eight minutes. I have a couple more topics to talk about. I'll skip one of them. Um, we want to move beyond using vision uh, purely as a, as a stereo system, purely as a, uh, a single measurement. We want to um, use visual feature tracking for a long period of time. We want to be able to overcome, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, this is just a very simple example of a failure mode of a controller that's not reasoning about slippage. So, uh, 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 it's just a piece of paper on the ground, the robot steps on it, and um, uh, the, the, the foot slips. So, the, 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 the state estimate of the robot in this particular case has a really large spike because it's, um, it hasn't, after it placed its foot firmly on the ground, it assumes that it's, it's a trustworthy point that the estimator can then use to drive. Uh, velocity measurements for the, for the robot. So you see uh, the true estimate in blue here derived from, from Vicon and the red estimate is, is estimated from uh, the animal state estimator and that effectively results, results in, a, in a spurious set of outliers um, and for that particular instance you would have you know, a significant amount of drift so that if you planned maybe a mission that was, uh, that, that was assuming a goal that you observed then all of a sudden the robot's going to be uh, pretty significantly lost. And that gets worse when you're when you're working on on trotting gates. So I show the upwards drift in the in the in the trotting estimator using only its internal estimate. But when you're building a terrain reconstruction, that really uh, really messes things things up. So you're you have an estimator in this case that's continuously drifting upwards. You're trying to create a terrain reconstruction, and what you see here is a colorized um, heat map that shows uh, the height of the robot. It was trotting on on perfectly flat ground, but its state estimator is continuously estimating with drift. And you can see this, these, this characteristic steps in the height map. Effectively, every time the robot's foot is striking the ground, it's, um, an, another uh, spike in drift is occurring, such that effectively, uh, if you look at this, this height map from the side, it's, it's looking kind of like a staircase. Um, the, these feet would, would not be uh, located close to the ground here. So if you're trying to do footstep planning with the footsteps that are the rear footsteps of the robot it's moving in this particular direction, then these particular feet will be planning onto incorrect terrain because the, 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 the state estimator is drifting. And this is a, this is a major limitation to be, for example, um, 
to be able to do things like trotting up a staircase or to be able to do dynamic maneuvers over, over terrain uh, uh, is that if the drift of the state estimator in dynamic motions is very high, then uh, your estimator is going to, uh, or your, your, your footstep planning algorithm is, is not going to be able to appropriately plan footsteps. And that's because at the heart, the problem is that at the heart the estimator is a filter, so we're incorporating uh, at, a, at, at time frame one, we're taking, uh, trying to estimate the, the, the position of the robot using uh, an assumption about the, a leg position, and then we marginalize out the previous set of states. Uh, we don't hold around the history of states. We repeat that process maybe within the leg position at the next iteration, and so on and so on. We have a filtering algorithm. It can be good because these kind of uh, slips that you saw there, they are relatively uh, time limited. So if you slip for maybe a few milliseconds or a few tens of milliseconds and the, and the controller can overcome that, then it no longer affects your state estimator later. Uh, but we'd like to be able to, for example, uh, continue or consistently estimate the position of the robot using all of the, so consistently estimate the position of the robot's foot using all sensor measurements and if possible then to remove the contribution of a leg uh, where, it, um, where it's uh, judged to have been a, a slipping foot. We'd also like to be able to incorpor incorporate vision over a long period of time uh, using uh, a visual inertia navigation. So tracking features for a long period of time and then using those to effectively shift the balance of, of legged state estimation from something that's heavily dependent on the legs of the robot to something that's heavily dependent on the visual system but can incorporate some of the, the legged system. So, uh, for example, you can see here uh, uh, some initial work that we've been doing on uh, visual inertial navigation on, on a walking robot. Um, you can see these illustrations of point features um, and uh, what you see in, in blue, in the, in the darkest blue, is the history of point features. So, corners and edges that are being observed in the environment have been tracked for 290 frames, 300 frames, so uh, I think we're operating at about 15 hertz here, so they're like 20 seconds we've been observing these features. So effectively, if, you're, if you can observe point features in the environment for an extended period of time, then effectively you can reduce your drift rate to negligible quality. Um, but the accurate retention of these visual features is dependent on being able to maintain these feature tracks for long periods of time. So you can see uh, some of these visual features that are, have been present now up to 380, 390 visual uh, frames. And where, where we contain, can maintain these very long visual feature tracks, uh, we can create a smoothing problem such that we can estimate the, the, the position drift of the robot with low, low drift. So we're working on uh, an algorithm that, we call, that Marcos called Villains, I guess. Uh, so visual, visual legodometry uh, uh, with inertial uh, sort of visual leg odometry, inertia navigation, navigation system. I think we maybe need to work on the acronym, but effectively it's it's fusing the history of um, leg odometry and inertial measurements, uh, uh, constraints to to the vision system, um, and it's uh, and allows us to effectively estimate the drift of the robot, um, or to to reject the drift of the robot during these kind of very dynamic gates. So we're hoping to be able to estimate the motion of the robot while doing the most, most dynamic trotting gates using only a combination, or using a, a, visual, uh, a visual dominated system uh, with inertial information to retain these tracks of these visual features, but incorporating only a little bit of the kinematic information from the robot. And this is a, a kind of a first result of, the, of uh, <coughs> tracking um, the robot's position using a trotting log. So you can see here um, the the estimator that's drifting upwards and, 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 and to the right is the standard estimator of the, of the, of the robot, this, this, this fixed frame here. And the bottom left one, uh, it shows some discontinuities at the moment, but it's um, effectively estimating visual features. So you can see these visual features which correspond to the left-hand side of, the, um, of, the, of the, the verge that the robot's trotting, on <coughs> the, uh, trotting here. Um, and as it's exploring, uh, it's outperforming the, the, the estimator that does not see the, the external world. Okay, um, so I think we're pretty much up with time. The last um, topics uh, were on train reconstruction. <coughs> Just briefly to say that the tendency is to move away from LIDAR reconstruction, which uh, has been used heavily by humanoid robots, gives very accurate reconstructions of, of the terrain, 
uh, we've moved first towards using uh, kind of connect type cameras uh, by incorporating uh, uh, the measurements into a, into a consistent reconstruction. As Marco mentioned yesterday, you can uh, build very accurate reconstructions. We uh, work to, um, to, to do this using, using stereo cameras as opposed to um, active, uh, active depth cameras like the Kinect. Uh, this is an illustration of reco a reconstruction work on the, on, on the Atlas robot. Uh, for humanoid footstep planning, the ter terrain reconstructions have to be very accurate. So you want to be able to take advantage of the full, uh, full flat regions where the robot might want to place its steps. Um, so the terrain reconstruction from stereo has to be very accurate. And this is uh, just an illustration of that system um, within a closed system for, for a humanoid robots. So this is the Atlas robot um, uh, back in MIT. <coughs> Uh, walking over an even terrain where it's co continuously extracting uh, flat regions from its reconstruction from its stereo system, um, using those to uh, reconstruct the terrain in front of the robot, and then planning uh, kind of two or three steps ahead of the robot to, um, to uh, plan its locomotion. Um, since then, with the development of more, uh, more uh, industrial vision based depth sensors, so this sensor doesn't have a a global shutter. So when you're using uh, the kind of commodity off-the-shelf uh, depth cameras like an Asus or uh, an Asus Extion or a Kinect, these cameras don't have global shutters, so your map becomes very blurred. Uh, moving to stereo, where uh, the, uh, the the cameras are being uh, carefully captured with synchronized cameras, but are but uh, you're really dependent on the on the presence of texture in the environment to be able to. To, to create those 3 d reconstructions, moving now towards using uh, cameras such as this um, Real Sense, which has a global shutter. It uses a projection of, uh, of infrared patterns so that it's able to project texture onto the ground outside of the visible field of view. And this is um, some very nice work from uh, Peter Frankhauser, formerly of, of the, the RSL group in Zurich. So this is a terrain reconstruction using the, these kind of cameras. They don't have the same quality as, as for example, a, a spinning LiDAR. But for quadrupeds, they're sufficient. For humanoids, they, they might result in uh, reconstructions that are not as accurate as, as you would like for footstep planning with a quadru or with a with a um, <coughs> with a, a biped. Also, uh, this particular sensor is much closer to the ground, so it's a, it's only one meter away from the ground. While for a a humanoid robot, you you have a depth camera at two meters away, then then the uncertainty in the measurements become more significant. Um, I'll finish there. I've had a couple more topics, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that stage. If, if anybody has any, t any questions about sensing choices, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to give recommendations or take questions afterwards. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay. Uh, did you have uh, experience with the soft terrain or compliant terrain, state estimation, uh, and how would you comment uh, it's better to um, what are the strategies to address these kind of situations? Um, uh, effectively, like effectively, this is uh, an, an example of, of creating drift due to the assumptions that you're making about the, the contact behavior being significantly worse. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on trying to use vision to independently estimate the motion. So then, then. Uh, if, you're, if you if you can tell whether your vision system is working well, if the visual features are being tracked stably, then you know your vision system is working. And if um, the odometry being estimated from the legs is significantly worse than the odometry being estimated from the vision, then you know your visual, then you know your, your legs must be doing something wrong. So is the covariance on the odometry in that case? Not, not just, well, not just the covariance, but like in this case, this is using this this error distribution was created using uh, using Vicon. So the the, this is the uh, the error of the velocity measurements from the uh, from the state estimator, and this this big outlier um, uh, tail here is from the the slip event in the, the robot stepping on the page. Uh, obviously, we don't have the Vicon system, so we can't create this in the field. But we're effectively uh, intending to estimate this using the visual systems to, to estimate uh, if the if the uh, velocity measurements from the feet are incorrect using the visual system um, and that will allow us to, to build a stronger classifier than um, uh, to, to determine the, the sort of behavior. Um, 
So that, that should be general purpose across different different uh, ground materials. So in the in the thing project, um, uh, some of the, the thing EU project uh, that, that we're also partnering, um, there the we're taking the animal into uh, into muddy environments where the, the robot's feet will be slipping quite regularly, walking on sand, um, and it's important to have the feedback to the controller that feet are slipping so that you can modulate the, the, the controller gait depending on, on, on the behavior. Um, I think you can do some things in the estimator uh, using the proprioceptive sensing as, as Marco mentioned, um, but to be able to use vision is, is, is very powerful. Um, the question, one of the questions is the latency because if you're, if you're using vision to estimate um, the, the motion effectively, you need to be able to do it with low enough latency that the controller can actually take advantage of it. It's no use inferring that the robot's feet are slipping um, 100, 200 milliseconds after the foot has gone on the ground because it's probably already been lifted off. Um, at this stage, I can see readily how this will work if, you know, if you're moving into sandy terrain, you can start uh, in, uh, detecting that the feet are slipping in that sandy terrain. But uh, for that very first footstep, um, uh, it's going to be difficult for the vision system to be able to be reactive enough to, to, to track slippage. Okay. Are you working on synchronizing or hardware triggering the different sensors that you're working with? Or do you just hope the measurements are coming fast enough and more or less synchronized? Uh, that's, that's a question to throw to Christian. Uh, during, uh, I, talked to him, I talked to him about it on Monday. I mean, uh, Marco's got very strong opinions about uh, uh, the, uh, I guess the IMU that we're using at the moment is uh, USB, is USB access. So, uh, the guys at Antibiotics are confident that if you just capture the IMU with low enough latency, that I mean, effectively you have independent measurements of rotation rate and acceleration. Uh, always when we were working hardware design, we all uh, like with Atlas, we didn't design the robot, we but we did get synchronized kinematics, uh, IMU and IMU sensing all all in one one synchronized bundle because it was polling the IMU. That's the appropriate way to set things up. I mean, uh, uh, there's always been a, this challenge of uh, appropriately um, synchronizing IMU and camera messages, especially when you go into this visual inertia system. We've started to get reasonable performance without proper synchronization. We're just using the IMU and the torso of the animal uh, with a non-synchronized vision system, both uh, plugged in through USB. But um, there is a, a newer version of the real sense that now is an IMU on board. But it's it's IMU wouldn't have the high, the quality that we, we would like. It wouldn't be uh, like a me, like a two thousand pound uh, euro MEMS that you have in the, in the trunk of the IMU or a fiber optic gyro, for example. Uh, that's it's certainly important to, to correctly synchronize the, the these measurements. But uh, sometimes sometimes that has to be done on a very rude level when you're developing a robot. Uh, it is very important though. I mean, this is the reason why the Skybotic sensor is still so heavily used in Rand Zurich is because it's uh, the hardware development of, the, of these, it's very, very difficult. Okay. Uh, Andrew? Uh, it's not quite high level question. Uh, I tend to see estimation as the dual problem of control. Mm -hmm. And so I, I always expect to find kind of the same stuff happening in estimation and in control, but that doesn't seem to be the case here because uh, in, in control for, for leg troubles, everybody's converging towards uh, optimization techniques, optimal control, MPC, yeah. with a lot of emphasis on contact modeling, like the smoothing out contacts or using modeling done with integer yeah. variables. And I don't see the same happening in estimation. I see much less use of uh, optimization techniques yeah, not I, I, much emphasis on contact modeling, integer variables, moving the contact models. Do you think that that is just a matter of time, and the same things happening in control are going to happen in estimation, or is there a good reason why that's not happening? No, I, I think the state estimation for closed loop control systems, but uh, it it you you you're required to create a suboptimal estimate as quick as possible. So give. If given all of the measurements from all of these different sensors, and uh, you don't have the problem of, of latency, uh, of data acquisition time, then we can create. A, there are estimators that effectively this is an optimal. This one here, this is a factor graph, uh, which is, which is 
like this is a factory graph using using optimization, but it, it requires this history of measurements. So there's so if you're keeping a history of measurements and you're you're incorporating, for example, vision into the, into the system and then optimizing a trajectory of um, of of the previous motion, that's of little use to the controller if uh, if it's created 100 milliseconds after the the controller has uh, has executed its 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 control uh, its control output. Does it say for NPC? Um, but but we don't have access to the images for <coughs> 30 milliseconds. Like they, 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 the, the, the pixels have not have not been transmitted from the camera into the computer to be to be to be work, worked with. So we, we, we can't have all of the all of the measurements in the same place at the same time. Uh, so uh, typically, this is structured that if you have like a visual slam system, um, you have a thread that is not connected to the controller that's getting that's maintaining your best estimate. Um, but you have to accept a uh, less good estimate that's using, for example, only the IMU and the kinematic information to, to feed to your controller. Um, so. Uh, I mean, yesterday Marco was talking about like a one millisecond control or control budget, or a five millisecond control budget if you're operating um, uh, operating a dynamic control system. So that that, that that's un unavoidable. These real time like this is a real time problem. <coughs> For me, it seems that this is kinematic estimation. So as long as you have kinematic estimation, it is not a It's quite simple way of solving the problem. But if you want to do dynamics, you want to estimate forces, I think it will be closer and closer to control this is what I so, so I think like you need to rely more on the I mean as Marco said in the very start start of his lectures, these estimators are effectively ballistic missile estimators. They are there's no force information being being used in them, but that's that's more of a pragmatic case in that the uh, force information, in, uh, um, like force contact information from like force car force torque sensors in, in a humanoid's foot, are 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 not a very good um, are, are, are are difficult to, to incorporate within these kind of estimation algorithms because they're typically used. As simple simple detectors about about whether a foot is in contact or not in contact, they're not used. Uh, they're not they're not very well used to forward propagate a motion model. So there's been there's very little work that that actually uses a force like that integrates um, the forces to create accelerations and integrates, <coughs> and integrates the accelerations to to propagate a, a motion model. So these aren't um, these state estimators don't use the dynamic model of the robot, and that's that's. That's for positive reasons. It, it decouples the estimation from the control system. So, um, so you, you're effectively estimating something with an IMU instead of estimating with your force torque sensors. Um, but it does leave there is there is room for research to uh, to use uh, dynamic model dynamic model to estimate the, uh, the forces that are being. But it does it does require that your contact behavior is properly modeled as well. And that's that can be a, that's often not the case, so that's why we tend back to using IMUs because it, it allows us to be wrong about the contact events. Okay. Maybe we'll keep other questions. I mean, we've already run into the break. I think. So, we'll, uh, if you have other questions, maybe come afterwards. We'll, we'll, we'll break for coffee now. Thank you.